guys, Wintermeet here, and welcome to the last episode of the Elements of Motion Graphics, where we're going to be exploring the use of the compositor and the video sequence editor, both built into Blender, in order to create post-processing effects on top of our motion graphics animation. Now, this video will include making an infinitely loopable animation with a base animation that we created previously in episode 2, and then we'll be creating some post-processing effects on top of that, including a glitch effect, chromatic aberration, and lens distortions. So let's get started. So let's start by making an infinitely looping animation. Go into the video editing tab, and here you'll find Blender's video sequence editor, an incredibly powerful uh, non-linear sequence editor, which is very useful for video editing, and if you guys are interested, I could definitely make tutorials about this because I use this to make all of my YouTube videos. Anyways, we're just going to be creating a track that goes forward in time and then play it backwards in order to have an infinitely looping ping pong sort of animation. So this animation is from the second episode design of the Elements of Motion Graphics. It's just something I animated quickly. And what we're going to be doing with this is just playing it backwards. So with this clip selected, duplicate it with Shift D, go under the video settings in this properties panel and click reverse frames. Now, just to show you what this looks like without reverse frames, it will stutter here because it's basically playing the same thing twice. However, if we reverse the frames on this, um, it will start from, this is 50 frames long, so it will start playing from frame 50 and then play backwards. Uh, and this will definitely slow down your computer. But the transition is hopefully smooth. And there we go. Now, we only want this to be 100 frames long, so we'll just cap it off here. Uh, we can change the number of frames from this setting. I'm not sure what this would be called, like a entry field. And then we can go back to the render tab right here, change the file format and render it. Just go to wherever you want. I can call this loop and hit control F12 to render. And that's all there is to it. All right, so on to compositing. The way I'm going to show how to do this is by presenting a couple of effects that you can add and showing you how to create node groups that permit you to create those effects. And you don't have to use all of them. And some of them are a little bit excessive, so uh, you can always ignore the ones that you don't feel are necessary. Now the first thing to do is to go into the compositing tab and click use nodes so we can actually see these nodes. I don't know why this isn't enabled by default, but well, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, you can use your mouse to drag around these nodes. And also, uh, since our video strip is only going to be a certain number of frames, that's probably not 250, you may want to alter that to be the correct number of frames. So my strip is 100 frames long, and I'm just going to change the uh, end of my render to only 100 frames. Now, in order to work with that video strip, we have to import it. Uh, so what we can do is select this, uh, select this render layers node, and hit X just to delete it. Then we can apply an input node, and you can import a movie strip like this. You can click this open, and I'll have this up on my website, but you can really use any video that you want. This effect will work well on simpler and complex videos, but um, this one is just going to be the one I will use. So now if we hit F12 to render, we should be able to see the effect. And this is our video clip, even though it, we don't have anything in our scene, and it will in fact ignore everything in our scene when we do this, since our scene is not being rendered. Uh, so you could de delete this default cube, or you can let it be. I'm going to delete it just for fun. Okay, so uh, now for the first effect, we're going to make some scan lines. Now you could do this procedurally by using a noise texture and uh, flattening it and then modulating it, but I just made a overlay in Inkscape, so I'm just going to attach that now. So what I'm going to do is import an image, um, and I will also have this up on my website. 
called scan lines, which I can't spell correct. And then I'm going to overlay this image on top of my um, actual render. So this is what the image looks like. It's sort of alternating black and white bars. And in order to layer these things, we can use a mix node. So you can hit space, I think. No, sorry, shift A, and then uh, you can click search to find whatever you're looking for. We're going to be using this mix node a lot. You can just drag it on top of this line in order to add it or like splice it into this node group. And then we can apply this mix node up. Now you notice this doesn't actually do anything. That's because our factor is set to 100%. Uh, so it's not going to show whatever else is there. We turn down the factor, not going to work, of course not. I believe the correct format is to use something like multiply. Okay, let's switch the order. Sometimes if this doesn't work, it's a good idea to switch the order. And of course, I'm not even previewing the render, which may be a good idea to do. All right, so there we go. That's our scan lines effect. Fairly simple. Um, yeah, make sure if you change this, this uh, what you're previewing, make sure you're actually on your render results so you can see what happens. So we can change we can change around the modes to see what will happen, but I think multiply is the correct one for the actual scanline effect and what it physically represents, um, which I think are like electron beams scanning across and causing some sort of weird distortions. Anyways, I like this sort of overlay. Of course, this is completely optional, so you don't actually need it, but uh, I kind of like the effect. Now, if we want to have these sort of scroll upwards, what we can do is we can apply a transform node. Now, this lets us change the position, rotation, and scale of our of whatever it's applied to. And what we want to do is gradually shift the y position of the scan lines upwards. So how we do that is we apply a, a transform node. So we can search this up if we want. And you could also you could also use a translate node since we're only doing a translation, but I like the transform node as it has more options in case we want to make some. Uh, for example, if we since we've spliced it in between, we can sort of rotate this image, uh, but I'm not going to do that. And we're just going to scroll it upwards. So you can see that if we scroll it too far upwards, this will go off the screen, uh, which is why I made a slightly bigger image. I'm sure you could also tile this, but I don't know how. And it's not too important. So yeah. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use this timeline in order to figure out where to put these effects. So I want to have these scan, scan lines moving throughout the whole uh, render. So I'm going to uh, insert keyframes through frames 0 to 100. So I can keyframe the Y position by mousing over this field and then hitting I, and you'll see it turns a different color, uh, which depends on your theme. I'm going to frame 100, and I will set this to something like 200, uh, maybe 150. Kind of random what I'm picking right now. And then hitting I again, and you'll see it turns a different color. And then you'll see if you watch this, um, you watch this animation that this number will move upwards, so will your scan lines. Now the effect might be a bit slight, but that's completely fine. Okay, now um, we kind of don't want to have all of these nodes in the tree, so a great way to hide them in order to pre prevent things from being messy is by making node groups. And this is just combining a bunch of nodes into a single node. Um, and the way we do this is select all of them by left or right clicking, depending on what you have your setting. I think it's left click now. Um, and then hitting control G. This is going to bring up a kind of complicated looking tab, but don't worry about it. This is like a function, a function machine or something. This is our input, and this is our output. You don't need to touch anything. To go out of this view, you can hit tab, and that's all we have to do. Now, if you want, we can also rename this to something a bit easier to use, uh, and we'll just call this scan, scan line. And there we go. We have a much simpler node group that we can always expand by hitting Control Alt G to remove the group. Don't do that because you'll have to do this again. 
but if you don't, if you want to remove a group, you can hit Ctrl LG with the group selected. Okay, now for the second effect. And these two, these two effects are just going to be sort of screen space and completely overlaid on top of the image, um, rather than flickering on and off like a glitch effect, which will come later. So uh, what we're doing here is we're going to add a little bit of lens distortion. So we can go into Distort, Lens Distortion, and we can apply it either before or after the scan line. Um, I think it would be a better idea to apply it um, afterwards, that makes sense, because our distortion will kind of curve this screen and we want both the scan lines and the uh, render, like the rendered image to be uh, distorted rather than just the rendered image because then the scan lines would be uh, horizontal while everything else was distorted. Uh, and we want to turn on fit, otherwise this will happen. So we want to turn on fit and it'll sort of just crop it. Um, we'll turn this effect way down to like 0 0.05 and we're also going to turn on some dispersion which sort of is um, an effect called chromatic aberration which happens when uh, light sort of splits at the edges of things and this is a pretty nice effect of course this might be a little bit much for you so you don't really need this you can turn on projector to remove the distortion effect and just have dispersion and you could turn that way up if you like uh, but we're going to be making a sort of improvised distortion, which will do a similar thing to this. Anyways, I will keep this on fit, and I'm going to turn this down to 0 0.05. And we'll have a pretty subtle dispersion effect around all of the corners. And of course, you can do this to any render, and I think it adds a little bit. This just sort of mimics the natural sort of distortions that you'll get when you're using a camera lens. Um, as the distortion and dispersion effects will happen whenever you're passing light through a glass lens, um, just because of the shape and the geometry and some optics I forgot from high school. Okay, now on to a more complex effect. Um, let's create some animated effects. So first, we're going to create a inversion effect, and these are just going to be color effects. So I'm sure you know what inversion looks like, but if you don't, that's what it looks like. Um, it just inverts the color. We're not going to have this showing through the whole video, as I think that would be a bit jarring. So what we'll do is we'll modulate the factor um, and animate this in order to have this sort of flicker into an inversion mode. Um, and I'd like this inversion to last for, say, 20 frames. Um, of course, that number is completely arbitrary, and you can pick whatever you like, but I think 20 frames would look good. So uh, we'll start at frame 50, so one frame before, oops, one frame before and frame 49, we're going to hover over this factor, set it to zero and hit I to keyframe it. Then at frame 50, we're going to uh, set this factor to one, hit I and keyframe again. We'll go to frame, how about 15 frames? Okay, so we'll go to frame 65. Don't need to do anything to this, we'll just hit I to keyframe it. And we're going to go one more frame. You can hit the right uh, right arrow key if you like, or you can just drag it by hand, um, set this factor to zero, and hit I to keyframe it. And there you go. The reason we're not putting a keyframe directly in the middle is because I don't want this to fade into inversion and fade out. I want this inversion to snap suddenly, as I think that's a better glitch effect. Now, of course, if you only want to have three keyframes, one at 50, one at 65, both being at a factor of zero and one at like 57 or 58 with a factor of one, you can go right ahead, but I think that would look bad. Um, another very useful color space effect we can use is the hue saturation value effect. Um, if you want to sort of modulate the uh, HSV values, now this will be most useful in a colorful image and it's going to be pretty useless in a black and white image, but you can create some pretty interesting effects here um, in case you think your render is not saturated enough. And you can always tweak around the colors and make some pretty cool looking animations. Yeah, I think that would look cool. And you can also animate this effect. Um, I think it would be cool to have this sort of overlaid with the inversion. So I'll have this start at 45, one frame back, 
you change to zero, uh, which is the hue frame of 0 0.5 will make uh, no change to the hue saturation value. That's sort of the default. Oh, and you can sort of see that lens warping effect here. You zoom out far enough, which is just like a, an artifact of the anti-aliasing that Blender uses. Okay, so then we'll go to like frame 52, keyframe this again, go one frame forward, set this back to 0 0.5, and yeah, there we go. So we'll have both a hue saturation shift as well as an inversion shift, and they'll be overlapping a bit in the middle. That's cool. Now we have most of our color space effects done, and these are all sort of single, pretty simple effects just by modulating single values in single nodes except for the scan line thing, which of course is slightly more complicated. Now onto a glitch effect. So this is going to be the most complicated of the lot and will be like three times as many nodes as what we've got here. Uh, so yeah, first we want to create a glitch texture. So we can go into, you can pick basically anything here. I don't think it really matters. I'm just going to go with clouds and you want to change the noise basis to cell noise. So you have sort of a pixel matrix effect. And then we can import it by going into textures. Um, and then we can just set the texture here. Now this texture is square and we want to make it longer and thinner. So what we can do is just up the Y scale and it'll stretch it out. Now you can't see this, but that's fine. Uh, just believe me, when you uh, change the Y scale, that'll make it thicker on the Y axis. Okay, so what are we going to do with this? Well, we're going to imagine having sort of like two layers of images and we're going to blend between them and only show pieces of each of them. And how do we say, like, how do we define like where the holes are in the top layer? Uh, well, we can do that by using a texture to define um, where the holes are. Now we can now, uh, in Blender, we can define sort of the black parts of the image as holes and the white parts as um, showing the top layer. And we want to cast everything to black and white, so we'll use a color ramp. We'll plug it through the factor, and then we can our easing to constant, and we can do this. Now, if you want to see what this looks like, we can actually just drag this in here. And so this is going to be sort of our noise texture. You just drag it into the composite and we can see what it looks like. Um, now this black sort of has a value of zero um, and this white has a value of one. And we want to keep everything sort of within this value range. Um, and you can also see the stretching effect that's going on. If we change this Y scale, uh, you can see what happens. And this will be sort of our noise texture. I like to have these long and thin stretches as opposed to like pixely ones because I think that looks better, but it's completely up to you. Okay, so now we have this set up. Uh, now we have to create that two images thing I was talking about. So let's create another mix node and we'll apply it here. We'll disconnect this and we'll just reconnect this so we can see the image. Okay, so what are we mixing? Well, we want to have our normal image, and then we want to have a different image um, at the bottom, or like a slightly distorted version. And I'm just going to go to frame zero because I don't want to see all the other effects uh, laid on top. Let's go to, I don't know, frame two, that's fine. So um, this is going to be our top image, and this will be our bottom image. If we change the factor uh, to zero, we'll only show our bottom image, I think. And if we show, um, if we set the factor to one, we'll show our top image, although that's easy enough to test. Now let's change this bottom image. Um, there are a lot of ways to change it. For one, we could just change the hue saturation value. So let's see what that looks like. Let's say we change the hue to one. Okay, so I was wrong. If your factor is one, it's only going to show the bottom image. And if your factor is zero, it's only going to show the top. Um, and one is equivalent to, uh, as a texture, a full white rectangle. Now, if we only want to show parts of this, we can input this noise texture. And you can see that only the parts that, um, okay, I'll show it here. 
Only the parts that are sort of black will show the top image, and the parts that are white will show the bottom image. Okay, so let's protect this. And uh, you can see this sort of cool effect of two images being overlaid. Now, how can we extend this? Uh, if you want to extend this, there are definitely a lot of things we can do. One, we can shift the bottom image left or right by using a, a transform node again, just like we use for the scan lines. Uh, this one we don't need to animate, and you can see that we've attached this to the bottom image. So now if we just shift it like 80, everything is going to be off slightly, and that's kind of the effect that we're going for, which looks pretty cool. Um, and that's pretty much all you have to do for the glitch effect. Now, uh, we should try to keyframe this. So this is our normal view, and if we just change the position of this, we can show we can see that we will reveal more or less of our glitched version. So let's find the maximum amount of glitch. See, if we set it all the way to the end, it will be completely the glitch version, and you won't actually see anything. So uh, we'll just set it to 0 0.5, and we're going to have a couple of glitch flickers. Now, it's not good to have this glitch go on for a lot of frames. Um, I think a quarter of a second is good. Uh, so we're just going to have this glitch effect extend over six frames. So let's make two of these. Let's start at frame 25. I'm just picking these numbers randomly. And we'll have everything go from normal to glitched and back to normal in the space of six frames. So uh, frame 25, keyframe the position. Frame 28, set this position to 0 0.5 or so. Keyframe the position again. Frame 31, set this position all the way back. Keyframe it again, and we'll have a nice glitch effect. Simple as that. Unfortunately, we can't see this in real time because well, my computer is not fast enough, but perhaps yours is. Also note that the more compositing effects you lay on top, the longer your rendering speed will be. But since this is a video clip and we're not actually rendering any geometry, it will be like half a second at most anyways. Okay, now we can apply a second one. So let's go to like frame 82. Again, we'll have the position, we'll keyframe it. Go three frames forward, you can just... Do three taps on the right arrow, glitch it, keyframe that glitch, frames forward, maybe not that many, back to normal, and keyframe it. There we go, we have two nice glitch effects. Okay, so uh, here's a question. What if you want to create a more advanced glitch effect where you're splitting the actual red, green, and blue channels of the image? Uh, well, we can do that by applying by splitting the actual RGB values, and this will rather complicate our node groups. Okay, so um, in order to do that, let's create let's create some more space here. So now everything here is kind of locked down. We don't really need to make too many changes to those, um, so we're going to be fine for that. And uh, let's create split, sorry, not split, separate uh, RGBA and a combine R. And we need to both separate and combine these uh, RGB nodes. And a simple way to do this is just to do, is just to connect them like here. And yeah, that's pretty much all there is. Okay, so now the idea here is that we want to make individual and different modifications to each of the channels. Um, and also we want to apply that to our bottom image. So let's remove this transform. Oh, and I, I should clarify, this is completely optional. If you want to, we could have been done if you're happy with that glitch effect, but this is just a more advanced effect. So let's just splice this in between. So instead of connecting the hue saturation value directly to this image input, um, we're going to split and combine the RGBA nodes. And then we're going to put them here. And we're going to transform each of them at once. So to the blue, red, and we can duplicate these. 
and perhaps make a little bit more space by dragging everything over. This looking complicated already. All right, so now let's go to a frame where we have, where we can actually see this glitch effect. I think start this. Right. Okay. Right here. So um, you can see this isn't too special, but we can shift. We can sort of separate the red, green, and blue channels and create a interesting effect. So if we just move on the red, um, we can see. All of the red components of things get glitched to the side. Um, I don't want this to be too much, let's say 80. Yeah, maybe like 150. And you can feel free to tweak these values as you like. Um, we'll leave the green as it is, and we'll change the blue to negative 180. Okay. And there we go, we have a pretty cool effect right here. And this will only show up, I think, during our actual glitch effect. And we'll be gone when we're done with it. So there we go. A pretty simple node group that lets us split our red, green, and blue channels, modify each of them individually, and recombine them into our image. We can call this sort of, uh, we can create a node grid for it, and then we'll call it like, uh, very rig. Aberration. All right, and that's the whole node setup that you want. Now you can send this to render, and we have a pretty cool motion graphic uh, video. Is that? If you want, you can also hit Control. No, sorry, Shift equals, and you can align all of these things in a straight line. But it kind of makes it hard to see what everything is doing. You might not want that. And here we go, that's our final motion graphic with compositing effects laid on top. Okay, and to render it again, we're going to go to this output tab here. Um, and then we'll change the file format to FFmpeg video or 12 anywhere to just render everything. Now, this might take a bit longer. See when this is done. All right, so that brings us to the end of our Elements of Motion Graphics mini-series. Hopefully you've learned how to create the geometric primitives we need for simple motion graphics in episode one, then learned how to compose them in a visually pleasing way in episode two, then in episode three we learned how to animate everything and use some principles of animation to create some cool effects. And finally, in this last episode, you've learned how to add post-processing effects to add a bit of visual flair to your animations. So if you enjoyed this series and you want to see more, feel free to head on over to my website, wintermutedigital.com, which I'll have in the description, where you can find plenty of other free Blender tutorials, including a full text write-up. Also, uh, feel free to subscribe to be updated when I post new content and like this video some more. Yeah. Alright, see you next time.